So what I'd like to do today is to again talk about a misunderstanding by many as to what Ronsay thought. In this particular case, what Ronsay thought about the rule. And then after that, I'd like to say just a short, give a short account of another misunderstanding of what Ronsay thought about uh, the Virgin Mary, the Mother of God. But let's start with the rule. I've mentioned something about this before in former conferences. And a lot of people for many years, and in Ronsay's own time, thought that he's, his view was that the rule of St. Benedict, which he was bringing back in accordance with the ideas of Julien Paris, Julien Paris, you remember him? He was the one who wrote that a book which so influenced Ronsay on the first spirit of the Order of Cito. In other words, they thought that Ronsay was bringing back the absolute strict letter of the law. The rule of St. Benedict was the rule which should be brought back. It would be the reformation, the reformation, the reformation of the whole order. If they would bring back the rule of St. Benedict in every meticulous detail to every jot and tittle of every letter, everything would be right again. Uh, the rule could not be changed. The rule must not be changed. The rule should not be changed. The rule was the iron armor that held the uh, uh, the order together. Bring it back and all will be well again. And this was not in fact what Ronsay was saying, as we shall see. He wrote, he wrote two things. He, <laughs> the spirit of the rule, the essence of the rule goes all the way through his works. Of course it does. But he wrote two uh, things in particular which were of major importance. There was one which was of lesser importance, uh, a thing called the Declarationes, the Declarations in the Rule of St. Benedict, but that was not written for public circulation. But the other, the books that were written for pu uh, public circulation, proved in fact remarkably popular. He first of all wrote, uh, produced a translation of the Rule of St. Benedict, and then he produced a much, 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 much more important work, which was, I'll translate to English, the Rule of St. Benedict, New Duly translated and explained according to its true spirit. Now that's a long book. It's the sort of same length as the long uh, book on the holiness and uh, duties of the monastic life. But it is, as I mentioned in an earlier conference, rather more, if I may use the term, user-friendly than de la Santité. Anyway, to understand this work, what it is, where it came from, we have to introduce somebody else whom we haven't met yet, a Benedictine, uh, not only a Benedictine, but a Benedictine of the uh, congregation of St. Maur. In other words, like Jean Mabillon, who we did meet earlier, this man is a Maurist who sees there's a spirituality scholarship and so on and so on. His name was Mej, M-E with an accent G-E, Dom Antoine Joseph, Anthony Joseph Meige, very fine scholar, very fine preacher, and to the uh, Benedictines uh, in actually in 1643, and as I said, he was a Maurist. And by 1659, he was teaching theology at the great Abbey of Saint Denis, north of Paris, and uh, just over 20 years later, he was appointed priory of, a, of another Benedictine priory, a Benedictine house. But the details, again, don't uh, matter to us so much. But toward the end of his life, toward the end of his life, he moved to the Abbey of Saint-Germain-des-Prés in Paris, which is the very heart of the Maurist congregation, the very seat, the, 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 the seat of the superior general of the Maurists and the very center of Maurist studies. And he died there on the 15th of April in 1691. Very impo an important man, uh, a very fine scholar indeed, very good preacher, and he was perfectly well aware, as everyone else was perfectly well aware, of what was going on at La Trappe and of Rancé's interpretation of the rule of St. Benedict. And what you have to realize, 
what you have to realize is the fascin I've mentioned this before, but the fascination of people generally and of other religions of other orders about La Trappe and about Ronce. He was, after all, one of the one, but not the only one by means, one of the most dramatic converts of his age. Here is the wealthy, handsome young man of our town with his paramour, the well-known Madame de Montbazon, you remember, who had the most welcoming bed in France, who goes from being the wealthiest, glamorous, living the wealthy, glamorous lifestyle to the absolute austerity of La Trappe. People are fascinated by this. And they're fascinated by, I've mentioned this before, they're fascinated by La Trappe. They're fascinated by the silence of La Trappe. They're fascinated by the diet of La Trappe. They're fascinated by the mortality of La Trappe. The whole, the whole thing. People were really intrigued about this. And people knew what was going on. Often they misunderstood or misknew, if I may use the term, what was going on. But Dom Antoine Joseph Mej, knew what was going on. He was a, he's a Benedictine himself. He knows the rule of St. Benedict inside out in his own interpretation, as it was interpreted in the congregation of the Morris congregation in, in, in which he lived and worked and had his being. Quite simply, he didn't agree with Ronce's interpretation of the rule of St. Benedict, which he thought was unreasonable and incorrect. And so, <laughs> being a man of his times, he wrote down why he did not think it was so. And he wrote in 60, he published a book in 1687, 800 closely printed pages, 800 closely printed pages, entitled, I'll give the English translation, Commentary on the Rule of St. Benedict, where the ideas and maxims of the saints are explained by the doctrinal statements of the councils, the holy fathers, the most illustrious monks, and the most important authors who have discussed monastic discipline. Titles at this time were as long as the books. And it go, the title actually goes on further than that. And what it was, was a direct and really aggressive attack. Beautifully written, I might say, but a direct and very aggressive attack on Rancé's interpretation of the rule, which, as I said, as far as Mej was concerned, was just unreasonable and wrong. That's all there was to it. And Rancé naturally read the book. Of course he read the book. And in fact, in, I'll give you a little, now a little bit of history, though you don't have to remember the dates. And on 14th of April, 1689, he wrote to a great friend of his, uh, Henri Barillon. He was the Bishop of uh, Luçon, a very great friend of uh, Rancé, telling him that it was, I quote Rancé, full of lax ideas and principles wholly opposed to the spirit of St. Benedict. And two months later, he wrote to another friend of his, uh, Don Dominique Georges, who was a Cistercian, the Cistercian abbot of another abbey called Val Richer, and he said that, I'm quoting Rancé again, the book of Father Mage does, now, does no honor to his congregation. In my opinion, they should have disavowed it publicly so as to exonerate themselves from it in the eyes of the world. Now, by this time, 1689, Rancé had completed the first version of his own commentary, the commentary I mentioned above, the rule of St. Benedict newly translated and explained according to so-and-so. He'd finished the first version of this when he came across the uh, uh, vicious criticisms by Mege. And in the same, when he, he wrote, you remember, to Barillon, to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, the Bishop of Luçon, telling him that Mege's book was full of lax ideas and so on. And in that same letter, in that same letter, he says that uh, his own book, his own book, in fact, contains exactly the right principles of the rule of St. Benedict, interpretation of the book is, is correct, and he would, and that Barillon, the Bishop of Luçon, would remember that they discussed the matter, and that Barillon would actually agree with Rancé that his interpretation was correct. Rancé always needed backing up. They all did, these people, but Rancé, Rancé was at heart an insecure person. 
I've mentioned this to you before also. He always needed to get support for his ideas. And so when he's writing something, as you know, he'll say something, and these are the authorities for it, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So he always has to get support. He always has to get reinforcement for his position, which is what he's doing here. But then, of course, as you can understand, he revises his commentary, taking into account measures criticisms. He revises his commentary. And when another great friend of his, a very, very important bishop in France, a man called Bossuet, one of the great pillars of the French church, uh, a very close admirer, a very close friend, admirer of Rancé, Bossuet read it, and Bossuet in a letter says, I find it wonderful in all its parts. And what is interesting is that Meiji's own superiors in the Morist congregation, in the Morist congregation, had found the criticisms that Meiji were making too strident, too harsh, and too unwarranted. Too unwarranted. And in fact, in, again, 1689, under pressure from Bossier, the Bishop of Meaux. Remember Bossier, you may not know about him, but he was, as I said, one of the most important and influential figures in the French ecclesiastical hierarchy, hierarchy at the time. Bossier pressures the superiors of the Morris congregation with success to have Meiji's book prohibited. In other words, to forbid it to be read, that the Benedictines of the Morris congregation should not be permitted to read the commentary of Mej and that that commentary should not be read by anyone in the congregation of St. Maur. This is quite something. Now, again, the Morris Superior General bowed to the pressure from Bossuet, this very, very important and influential man, and in fact did ban the reading of Meiji's commentary. This is a great triumph, of course, for Rancé. Now, this is not to say, this does not mean that all Benedictines approved of Rancé's own interpretation, which, of course, they read, despite its length. Everybody read, everything was long at this time. There was, there was, there was standard. Some loved it, uh, some did not, absolutely. And, uh, Rancé himself, actually, in another letter at the time, uh, gives his own views as to why, in fact, he wrote the book, stating how he thought it was most important to uh, not only to explain the rule uh, in, uh, in, in its true spirit, but that it would be of immense help, therefore, to any, uh, anyone of any religious order to understand what St. Benedict was trying to say, because what St. Benedict was trying to say, what St. Benedict was saying, was fully in accordance with the principles set out by Jesus Christ himself in the Gospels. And he goes on at some length about this. But for our purposes here, the most imp there's one really important word in the title of that book. Now listen to the title again in English. The Rule of St. Benedict, newly translated and explained according to its true spirit. What's the most important word there? Not rule, not Benedict, not newly, not translated, not anything except esprit, spirit. It does not say the rule of St. Benedict, newly translated and explained according to its true letter, the letter of the law. It's veritable esprit, it's true spirit. What Rancé was trying to get at was not, in fact, the literal interpretation, letter by letter, of the law, of uh, the rules set out in the uh, rules of St. Benedict, but the true spirit, spirit of it. So, in that case, does that not suggest, if we look at the spirit of it, that the rule might, in fact, in some cases, be amended or changed or altered in some way. And Rancé says, certainly it may. Certainly it may. We've mentioned this before. And not only may it be altered in some ways or changed in some ways or so and so, but it should be and must in case in some cases be changed and in some cases has been changed. And he goes on to explain, in fact, in other, in other writings, just how this is so. And what he does 
is first of all to distinguish between what are called in French précepts, précepts and conseils, precepts or commands. In other words, a precept or command is something you must do. If I say you must now get up and go out of the room, that's a command. But if the other ones are conseils, counsels or recommendations. In other words, there is a fire raging outside here and there's a tree about to fall on the building. I would strongly recommend that you get up and leave this room because otherwise you're going to die. That is a recommendation. That is a recommendation. So he distinguishes, in other words, between commands and recommendations. In so doing, he is following directly in the footsteps of his beloved Bernard of Clairvaux, who wrote a book, as you know, called On Precept and Dispensation. And Bernard himself distinguishes clearly between things which are commanded and things which are advised. No question about it. And then he goes on to say, even among the precepts, even among the commands, even among the commands, not all have the same authority. And he goes on to say, there are five sorts of precept. And at the risk of boring you, I'm going to tell you what they all are. Now, first of all, says Ronse, this is really important stuff. First of all, there are some commands or precepts which, which are the very essence of the rule and they remain absolutely, totally, and completely unchangeable. They cannot be changed. No exceptions may be granted here. No dispensations may be granted here. No changes may be granted here. Does he give examples? Yes, he does. Shall I give you examples? Of course I will. Ron says examples. The commandment to love God can't be changed. The commandment to love God and our neighbor cannot be changed. All these appear in the rule. I'm not going to give you rule numbers and that would be tedious if you can find them out for yourself, but every one of these appears in the rule. The command to love our enemies is in the rule. That cannot be changed. To show patience when we are wronged, that's in the rule. It cannot be changed. And all those precepts in the rule that demand the essential, the essential virtues of humility. Remember, Augustine, there are three steps to God, humility, humility, and humility. And, of course, obedience, which is so important to uh, Ronse. Those cannot be changed. Those are the very heart, essence, nature of the rule. Nothing can be done about them. Secondly, there are other precepts which, which are really important in themselves and they remain, they remain of first importance, even though in many places, in many places, they've been relaxed or mitigations have been carried out. In other words, they should not have been changed, but they have been changed. So what? Well, Ronson gives examples. Flight from worldly people, flight from the world, the separation of what is inside the cloister wall and the world outside the cloister wall. Too many places, he said, have changed this and are, the monks are mixing with seculars or seculars are mixing with monks. This is bad. This is a mitigation of the rule. These precepts have been changed, but they should not have been changed. They should not have been changed. He gives another example, the whole principle of flight from the world, that the monastery is a tomb, that once you're there, that's where you are and that's where you stay. That too has been often mitigated. The demand for perfect silence. There are too many places where this has been diminished, where monks are talking among themselves, where chattering is going on, even to a limited extent. That should not have been changed, but has been so. And Lectio Divina, Lectio Divina sometimes has been put aside and because, oh, we'll just go into the church, the liturgy suffices, we won't bother with this. This too is something which he says has been changed but should not have been changed. Those are the second, those are the second group of precepts. Precepts which in fact should not have been changed but which, alas, have been changed. So that's a bad thing, that's a bad thing. But thirdly, Thirdly, he says, 
On the other hand, there are precepts, commands, of lesser consequence, lesser importance, that may be ended or abolished or changed in the course of time, or the course of time. And he gives examples. The actual ceremony, he calls the ceremonies of the divine office, the way in which the divine office is carried out. The ruler of St. Benedict gives details as to how the office should be carried, what psalm should be said, exactly at what time. He said, there are times when though this now was appropriate for Benedict's day, but this can be mitigated without losing the true spirit of the divine office. We don't have to go the letter of the law on this one. And the way in which he says the hours are distributed, the rules and Bendix sets out how the hours should be, how the, what hour, when the hours should be. But he said, we can change that depending upon the circumstance and the time without losing anything of the essence, the spirit of the rule. And he says, another good example is the education of children. The rule clearly indicates that we have child oblates in the monastery and tells how they are to be disciplined and all the rest of them. Ronsay says that too has been abolished in the course of time and at that time and since that time children were not were not educated in succession. This is one of the differences between the Benedictine monasteries which tended to, which are quite happy to educate children and the Cistercian monasteries which generally speaking generally speaking did not. That's another good example says, says Ronsay. We can remove that part of the rule without losing anything of the spirit of the rule. Now, fourthly, fourthly, he says, in a similar way, there are precepts, commands set forth in the rule, which have been changed because of changing times. So as to be more profitable, he uses these terms, so as to be more profitable and useful than if the rule were kept to the letter. In other words, these things have been changed because in changing them, we would be more true to the spirit of the rule. But if we kept them to the letter, we would not be. And he gives, uh, he gives again, examples, all of which are to be found in the rule. Um, the rule requires at certain times, the washing that the abbot, the, uh, the abbot should wash the feet of guests and indeed the whole community. That is unnecessary, uh, says Ronsay. That has been just faded away and that's just as it should be. The rule permits a separate table for the abbot, as you know, a separate table. Ronsay says, no, the abbot should eat with the monks. So in other words, we take this idea that the abbot should have his own table, we remove that and that's, that's right and proper. That's right and proper. And there's another, <laughs> uh, the rule has uh, uh, various regulations uh, of the, for the expulsion of incorrigible monks. Monks who have been rebuked and who refuse to accept these rebukes, they can be removed, etc. and the ways in which they can be removed from the monastery. That can go, says Ron said. That is not, it does not help the rule. It doesn't help particularly the spirit of, it is not in the spirit of the rule. So such these things, these sorts of things have been changed and they should have been changed. That's right. That's exactly right. That's exactly as it should be. And fifthly and finally, he says, fifthly and finally, there are some precepts, commands, which have been changed or mitigated by the authority of the church. In other words, we have been told by ecclesiastical authority to uh, um, to change these things. Now, sometimes, sometimes this is a good thing. Sometimes this is not a good thing. For example, the requirement that our rules, the requirement to abstain from meat, either the meat of quadrupeds, and ecclesiastical authority said, no, there are certain circumstances and certain times when meat may be eaten. Uh, and Ranse says, well, ha, 
we have to go along with the exactly authority, but in that case, we will limit very much the time when this is so, that when the monk is so sick that they can hardly stand up, but fair enough, they may go into the infirm infirmary and may eat, may eat meat, but we don't like it. But we have to go along with the ecclesiastical authority on this one. Um, and there were one or two other things that he says. So in other words, there are some commands in the, in the rule of St. Benedict, which nowadays we don't abide by, rightly or wrongly, because we've been told not to, and we don't argue with ecclesiastical authority. But those are the five things, he says, even precepts that appear to be commands can be changed, sometimes have been changed, sometimes, importantly, should be changed. And then it goes on that beyond that, of course, there are recommendations in the rule which again might and should be changed because they can be changed to lead to a better appreciation of the spirit of the rule and more importantly to an even greater degree of perfection and there's one typical there's one really good example and uh, I will give you a hint and when I raise my glass on the table I say cheers and take a, a drink of wine the question of wine. All of you who are Cistercians know that the rule of St. Benedict permits wine. And it permits, in fact, that each monk in the, or none in the course of a day may be given a hemina of wine. It was round about 10 fluid ounces at the time. There was, in fact, as you might expect, long disquisitions written on exactly how much the Hemina was and all the rest of it. Uh, and this is perfectly, this is sufficient for each monk. But, says Ronce, what does St. Benedict say then? He says, and he quotes St. Benedict, but those who by God's gift can endure total abstinence will have their own reward. In other words, if you can abide it, if you can manage to keep away from wine altogether and be totally sort of a teetotal in this matter, then do it. And this then is a clear example of an advice in the rule, a permission is given in the rule, but in which that permission is better abrogated in order to lead to a life of greater perfection. So we change the rule. Even though this is permitted, it is better that we go this route rather than the other route. So, so what are we going to say then about Benedict's own clear statement? And I quote Benedict, as Ransley does, in all things let us follow the rule, let us all, let all follow the rule of the, as their master, and let no one be so rash as to deviate from it. So what's one second do about this? He's already said precepts, some precepts should, some precepts must, etc., etc. Then a command, there's advice, which in some cases we should not follow. How do we reconcile this? And Benedict saying, do not deviate from the rule. In order to provide you with a full understanding of this passage in the rule, my brothers, I'm quoting Ranse, I would say to you that there are two sorts of precept. Command. One group is interior and spiritual and deals with how the heart should be ruled, moral direction and the living of the inner life. Examples of this he gives examples, are the sections in the rule on good works. No changes there, do not deviate. Poverty, poverty of spirit especially, and poverty, don't own anything. No deviations there, no, none at all. Humility, certainly no change there, no deviation. Prayer, as you know, absolutely essential. No deviations at all. The zeal the brothers should have in helping one another, he says. This is fraternal charity. And remember, the charity is the highest form of love. That cannot, must not be changed. Do not deviate from that. No. And, and the requirement that they subject themselves to their monastic superiors. 
obedience. That cannot, must not be changed. Do not deviate there. But there are other things. The second group, the second type of precept is an external precept, a precept which is called an exterior or external precept. Examples, abstinence from meat. We can change that. We can deviate from that a bit. Rather, the rule just says no meat from quadrupeds. We can change that, and he's going to. We can change that. Uh, the rule requires fasting at certain times. We might, in fact, increase the fasts for a life of greater perfection. The rule requires mentions vigils, but we can deviate from the rule by, in fact, perhaps increasing those vigils in order to make, uh, in order to uh, produce a more perfect and a more beneficial life for us. And uh, there are other things, uh, and he, he, he goes on about the manual labor and so on. These things are all set out in the rule. They all form what, what are the exterior the external comments, what we're doing in our lives, maybe those, maybe those we can in fact deviate from in order to make our lives more perfect. And as I said, the precepts in the first group, the first group, that's the, one, the ones we mentioned before, such as good works, obedience, poverty, humility, prayer, etc., etc., cannot be changed, and they admit, says Ronsley, of no exceptions and no dispensations. Listen to what he says. A religion, a religious who fails to keep these precepts breaches the rule, he says. Breaches his trust and violates what is most important and most essential in his or her profession. But again, among the second group, there are some which are not subject to change, which are some which should not be uh, subject to deviation. Example, obedience. Example is poverty. They're the very, he said, the foundation of monastic life, and we cannot forget them. We cannot forgo them without destroying that life. But there are others, he says, even though, even though they are necessary and uh, we are commanded to keep them, are actually subject to the authority of the superior of the monastery, the abbot or abbess who stands in the place of Christ. They have the authority to change some of these, not to do away with them, but to amend them, depending upon circumstances. Examples, absence from meat. Example, uh, the fast, vigils, attendance in choir, the solitude, the silence, he says, and manual labor. And then he goes on. Dispensations may indeed be granted for these. But now listen. Now listen, listen, listen. Dispensations may indeed be granted for these, but only if done in the spirit, spirit of the rule, in cases of real necessity, and for just reasons, and legitimate considerations. In other words, there are quite a number of things in the rule which may be altered, amended, and changed by the authority of the abbot or the abbess, but only after very careful consideration as to whether this is right and proper. And this is, in fact, what Bernard says in his De Preceptua Dispensation, his, his writing on precept and dispensation, which Rancé is following really quite carefully here. And Rancé, as you know, says that Bernard, Bernard had, in his one person, had more authority for his absence monks than a thousand others. So yes, there can be changes. Sometimes there should be changes, sometimes there have been changes, sometimes there must be changes. On the other hand, it cannot be doubted that in some cases Rance made the rule stricter than Benedict ever intended. 
There's no question about it. And the most obvious example of this, and the one which is most notorious outside the walls of that trap, was the question of meat. The rule says you cannot eat the meat of quadrupeds, four-footed animals. I quote, let all abstain entirely from eating the flesh of four-footed animals, save for the sick who are very weak. It does not, in fact, prohibit eating birds. A Benedictine monk, for example, may not be permitted to eat a uh, juicy beefsteak, but there is nothing in the rule to prevent him from eating uh, a very tasty roast chicken. Rance, in the reform, demands strict vegetarianism. And this would become one of the marks and one of the features of the strict observance. And one of the most, as I mentioned before, one of the most notable and most uh, remarked upon in the world outside the cloister walls. Rancé is obviously well aware of this and he has to deal with it. So in his work on the holiness and duty of the monastic life, he poses the question, I quote, can we not believe that St. Benedict allows us to eat birds and poultry, since the only thing he forbids in his rule is, he, is eating the flesh of four-footed animals? It poses the question, because the whole of his, uh, the, all of his um, uh, book on the holiness and duty of the monastic life is set out in this way. He poses the question, what is a monk? Then he answers the question. How should a monk behave? He answers the question. In this case, Benedict doesn't permit anything, doesn't, doesn't say we can't eat anything with two legs, uh, except presumably people, but uh, so come on, why can we not eat this? So Ranza has to give an answer, and he does. There's 15 pages of it. It goes on for a long, long time. And in the course of it, of course, he has to give his authorities because he, he won't just state it, he has to give his authorities. And who does he quote? I will tell you, he quotes directly from Jerome, from Julianus Pomerius, from Theodomar of Monte Cassino, and from the Benedictine Assembly held at Aix-la-Chapelle in 817. He quotes from Hildegard of Bingen, Saint Columbanus, Saint Gunther of Bohemia, no less, Fructuosus of Braga, I a minute, Grimlock, I haven't finished yet, Elro de Rivo, Bernd of Clairvaux, the Desert Fathers, Pope Benedict the Twelfth, Aldrich Vitalis, William of Malmesbury, and Gregory the Great. Now, in other words, what he's saying here is if you disagree with me, you're disagreeing with, and I won't read them all again, but these are the authorities. This is my authority for this. But the essence of it, what's the heart of it? What is his real authority for this change, for this strict vegetarianism? I will tell you in the next conference.